There has only been one no-hitter thrown in the history of Coors Field, and it was thrown by Hideo Nomo back in 1996. Fast forward nine years, and Nomo is 35 years old. But in this span, MLB and World Baseball as a whole drastically changed. Matsui reaches out and hooks it down the line. That is trouble. In the corner, it is gone for a home run. In 2003, power-hitting outfielder Hideki Matsui left Japan for MLB when he signed a three-year deal with the Yankees. Matsui said he had been watching American baseball for a long time, but it was only in recent years when he began to realistically think about moving over to MLB. This begs the question, why would a guy who is considered one of modern Japanese baseball's greatest hitters say it was only in recent years that realistically I've been thinking about playing in MLB? Well, it's not necessarily a talent issue, rather a cultural issue. Between 1996 and 2003, 14 Japanese-born players left Japan to join MLB. Before 1996, only two Japanese-born players had played in MLB, Hideo Nomo and Masanori Murakami, who left Japan back in 1964, over 30 years before Nomo made his MLB debut in 1995. There's a reason why Nomo is a baseball legend, and it's not just because of talent or his unorthodox windup. It's for how he impacted Japanese baseball. Before I continue, if you guys end up enjoying the video, leave a like and subscribe to the channel to stick around for future content. Also, if you have one, leave your butterfly effect scenario in the comments. All right, let's go. Before Hideo Nomo's debut in 1995, Masanori Murakami was the first Japanese player to play in MLB. In 1964, Japanese professional baseball wasn't as established as it is today. So teams were interested in sending players to the US as a kind of sporting cultural exchange program to learn about American baseball and bring that knowledge back to Japan. So the Nankai Hawks sent Murakami along with two other players to play for the San Francisco Giants, who sent them the single A Fresno. After his first appearance, it was clear that Murakami was the real deal. And Masanara Murakami, who had more problems with the language than with opposing batters. He ended up winning the Single A League's Rookie of the Year award, which convinced the Giants to call him up for a playoff push, becoming the first player of Japanese descent to play in MLB. As noted by a report from Shukan Baseball, our dream has come true after 30 years of effort since the establishment of Japanese professional baseball. History has been made. Murakami put up great stats in his nine-game big league stint, but the question was whether or not he would go back to Japan. The Giants paid the $10,000 fee to the Nankai Hawks to keep him around for the 1965 season, but Murakami wrote a letter to the Giants' owner saying that he was homesick and wished to return to Japan. In reality, the Hawks told Murakami to write the letter. During this ordeal, Murakami said the information he received from both teams was basically opposite from each other. In the end, Murakami stayed with the Giants for the 1965 season and returned to Japan in 1966. While his Giants teammates were happy to see Murakami back on the team, this whole ordeal damaged United States and Japanese baseball relations for decades. In 1967, the United States Japanese player contract agreement essentially meant that NPB players had to stay in Japan and MLB players had to stay in the US. For the following three decades, this is how it worked and as time passed, contracts in MLB became more lucrative and the talent disparity between the two leagues grew further apart. This led some Japanese players to dream of taking their talents to MLB, but the first player to truly challenge the system was Hideo Nomo. In the first round of the NPB draft, multiple teams can draft the same player, but only one of them can win their draft rights. In the 1989 draft, a record 8 out of 12 teams drafted Nomo, but the Kintetsu Buffaloes were the lucky team to draft him. There had been long-time concerns on whether Nomo's tornado-like delivery could work at the pro level. Not only did he immediately succeed in his 1990 rookie season, he won the Rookie of the Year, the Pacific League MVP, and the Sawamura Award, the NPB equivalent of the Cy Young. 
However, he wasn't done there. After the season, MLB All-Stars faced NPB All-Stars in a series of exhibition games. Here's Hideo Nomo striking out All-Star Julio Franco, as well as facing All-Stars Cecil Fielder and Barry Bonds. All-Star MLB players were watching this 22-year-old rookie in astonishment, with one announcer believing Nomo could start an MLB right away. Japanese baseball historian Robert Whitting claimed that Randy Johnson told Nomo that he was wasting his time pitching in Japan, and Nomo believed belonged in MLB. However, there was the question, could a Japanese player really make it in MLB? It had been so long since Masanori Murakami played for the Giants. Pitcher Shigatoshi Hasegawa talked with Nomo about the prospect of pitching in MLB all the time, but everyone knew the story of Murakami. What I neglected to mention in Murakami's story was how he was treated by the Japanese media. He was dubbed as a greedy traitor, which was a big reason why he returned to Japan after the 1965 season. He wanted to stay in the US, but to defy tradition was a really difficult thing to do. As a result, for the next couple generations of Japanese players, playing in MLB was just a dream. Hasegawa told Nomo, don't be ridiculous, you're not gonna make it. Well, in 1994, a decision by the Kintetsu Buffaloes altered baseball forever. Buffalo's manager, Akira Ogi, who was considered an easygoing manager, was replaced by Japanese Hall of Fame pitcher, Keshi Suzuki. Suzuki followed a much different philosophy, which can be summarized like this throw until you die. Suzuki believed the remedy for a sore arm was to pitch more. Nomo resented these types of traditional philosophies. In the same way that tradition soured Masanori Murakami's relationship with the Japanese public, tradition was destroying Nomo's arm as he spent half the 1994 season on the shelf. After many successful seasons, Nomo wanted out of NPB. But how could he do it? Following the 1994 season, Nomo met with Don Nomura, a 36-year-old former NPB player turned agent. However, he didn't represent anyone in Japan. In fact, at the time, NPB players didn't have agents because they were seen as a sign of greed. Once you were part of a team, you were basically locked in forever. NPB introduced free agency in 1993, but Nomo would have to wait until he accumulated 10 years of service time to leave, which wouldn't be until around the year 2000, so this wasn't an option. Like Nomo, Nomura rejected Japan's rigid baseball culture, so these two were the perfect duo to truly challenge the system. After some digging into the 1967 US-Japan agreement, Nomura, his lawyer Gene Afterman, and US-based agent Arne Tellum found a loophole the Voluntary Retirement Clause. If a player petitions the cancellation of their contract, the player is announced as a voluntarily retired player by the president of the league, and that player becomes free of their contract. However, Nomo couldn't just retire then move to the US. He had to be placed on the voluntarily retired list, and his team, the Kintetsu Buffaloes, needed to approve his retirement. But why would a team approve the retirement of their 26-year-old ace? Well, Nomo and Nomura's plan was to anger the team so much that they needed to put Nomo on this list. So, during contract negotiations, after the team offered Nomo a pay cut ahead of the 1995 season despite being the best pitcher in the league, Nomo not only demanded a pay raise, but a multi-year deal as well, something unheard of at the time. You want to know the team president's response? Are you kidding me? You're just a kid. We don't give out multi-year contracts, and you can't ask for that kind of money. Besides, Besides, you've got a sore arm. You know, the same guy who employs a manager that once forced Nomo to throw 192 pitches despite winning the game 8-1. to After demanding the same conditions a month later, the team threatened to place Nomo on the voluntarily retired list, essentially to halt his career. This is exactly what Nomo wanted. Okay, I'll retire. And just like that, baseball changed forever. Well, not quite yet and some players are vying for their place in history, the specter of a strike hovers over baseball's magic kingdom. And there's an irony at work here. Roger Maris may have his 61 and 61 home run record saved by a season that will be scarred with asterisks if baseball is struck in a dozen days.
the cancellation of the 1994 season caused baseball fans to sour on the product. Interest was at an all-time low, fans were boycotting, it just wasn't a good time for baseball. There were fears that many fans, regardless of when this deal got done, would stop watching games for good. With this going on in the background, Nomo was meeting with many teams, including the Giants and Mariners, but the Dodgers stuck out the most because of owner Peter O'Malley, who Nomo found a personal connection with. Then, on February 13th, 1995, Nomo signed his contract with the Dodgers. A minor league contract with a $2 million signing bonus. Considering the contracts that future Japanese pitchers received, this was a massive underpay for Nomo's talent level. But there was still the looming possibility that Nomo wouldn't fit in MLB. Well, after the strike ended, Nomo wasted no time introducing himself to the rest of the league. Nomo ended up pitching one of the greatest rookie seasons ever. He led the league in strikeouts, shutouts, and hits for nine. His ERA Plus is the third best in MLB history among rookie starters who pitched at least 28 games. Nomo's historic rookie season, known as Nomo Mania, helped bridge the gap between pre-strike and post-strike baseball. Before the steroid era brought fans back in the late 90s, MLB experienced a major decline in attendance in 1995, but according to the accounts of many people, including Commissioner Bud Selig, Nomo was the number one story in baseball. Don Nomura was getting phone call after phone call regarding endorsements, movies, pretty much everything, which led to Nomo getting his own Nike signature shoe in 1996. Japanese fans were conflicted at first, but Nomo became a fan favorite pretty quickly. A reporter from a Japanese sports newspaper said Nomo was more popular than the Prime Minister and more famous than Sadaharu O the greatest player in Japanese baseball history. Thousands of fans back in Japan camped out to watch Nomo's games on TVs across the country. Nomo had achieved his dream. Overall, Nomo had a successful MLB career as he received Cy Young votes in two different seasons and he threw two no-hitters, becoming one of only five pitchers to throw a no-hitter in both the American League and National League. But Nomo's influence on baseball stretches far more than his accomplishments on the field. After Nomo's successful rookie season, numerous Japanese players expressed interest in leaving Japan for MLB. One of these players was Hideki Irabu, whose journey to MLB was its own debacle, which I briefly talked about in this video right here. The final straw was when Alfonso Soriano used the same loophole Nomo used and left NPB in 1998. After this, the two leagues agreed to what's known as the posting system, where an MLB team has to pay the player's parent club a release fee on top of the contract the player has been offered. This system applies to players with less than nine years of service time, which is why Hideki Matsui never went through this system when he signed with the Yankees. But many players from Japan and Korea went to MLB through the system, including Ichiro Suzuki, Daisuke Matsuzaka, Yu Darvish, Hyunjin Ryu, Masahiro Tanaka, Shohei Otani, Seiya Suzuki, and ha Sung Kim. Nomo's dominance in MLB allowed the league to tread through a significant dip in popularity. But without Nomo taking a significant risk by leaving his home country, who knows what the relationship between MLB and NPB currently looks like. Japanese players credit Nomo for influencing the generations of players after him to pursue their dream of playing in the majors. Nomo's decision wasn't without adversity. Aside from the media storm, both Nomo and Nomura were shunned by their family, friends, and the general public. What these two had done was seen as dishonorable and traitorous. Nomo could have easily stayed in Japan as the country's best pitcher, but he wanted something more. Nomo's desire to play in MLB led future Japanese players to consider a new path once thought to be unthinkable. I think former Dodgers GM Fred Clare put it best. He was willing to risk his reputation in Japan. He was willing to risk what he had accomplished as an outstanding and popular player in Japan. He was willing to put all of that on the line, not knowing whether he would be successful, but believing in himself. And that's why Hideo Nomo was a true pioneer. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Leave a like if you did. Subscribe to Stark Raving Sports. Check out my channel, Sportstorm, and leave your butterfly effect in the comments. Thanks for watching.